Welcome to Who Are You? This is the Babylon 5 Watchcast, hosted by two former strangers, now friends, who have gotten to know each other while rewatching a favorite show from their childhood, Babylon 5. I'm Jafer. And I'm Laura. And we've got a special guest today. Hi, Adam. Hey, that's me. I'm Adam. Adam Pranica. So, Adam, as is our tradition on this show, when we have a guest, we ask them, Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Do you know who I am? Who am I in terms of uh, how people know me? People know me from my two popular Star Trek podcasts, The Greatest Generation and Greatest Trek. Mm -hmm. And you've probably gotten to know me a little better at Star Trek Las Vegas Mm -hmm. at this moment in time. Uh, Yeah, I've, I've been around. I've been podcasting a long time. How long have you been podcasting? We've been doing this together for year and a half we've more than that we've got 80 something maybe maybe 90 episodes out for this one hey that's great so it's sticking yeah i think once you make it past 50 episodes i think you're here to stay yeah i've heard that it takes 100 episodes to get good so we're closing (laughs) in i think we have close to a thousand episodes and i'm still waiting for that moment (laughs) you've been there (laughs) yeah i have a podcast in my past that no longer runs called draft the universe and then I have another podcast beside this, which is a little baby podcast. It only has 10 episodes called Last Time On, which is a review podcast where my podcasting partner, Ben, and I watch a show that neither of us have ever seen before, watch an episode, roll some dice, skip that many episodes, and then try to figure out what the hell happened in between those two. Oh, how about that? You're uh, gamifying the show. Yes. That sounds like fun. It's a good time. It's, it's a fun podcast. I'm enjoying it. So that's all exciting. The Fugitive is what we're watching today. Yeah, why did you choose The Fugitive? (laughs) So we do mid-season breaks with movies Uh that have actors from the show Babylon 5 in them. And in this case, Sykes is played by Andreas Katsoulis, who is Jakar in Babylon 5, which is one of the main ambassadors. And he's also Tomalak in Star Trek. He sure is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a great it's face fun. he's got. Right? <laughs> Indeed. One of the great faces in Hollywood. For sure. Now on Babylon 5, do they cover him with a bunch of loaf, or is he, oh, for he sure. letting that thing dangle? No, they sure cover it. <laughs> Why would they do that? It's such a great <laughs> instrument. They even put him in uh, red contacts. They gave him an episode where one of his eyes is gone, and they give him a prosthetic eye. And wow. instead of letting him... Use his natural eye color. They put mm-hmm. him in another eye a color contact. third eye color contact. He's yeah. so recognizable. Maybe that's what they were trying to do. Like, that's a good point. He's so yeah. distractingly Andreas Katsoulis mm-hmm. <laughs> that you want to cover him with loaf. Make him yeah. fit in. I've never seen a minute of Babylon 5, though, so I might not even recognize him. Yeah. I'm, and I'm look so at me surprised. on a Babylon 5 podcast. I right. know. We're so proud. <laughs> <laughs> Would you have actually watched an episode of Babylon 5? No. no. Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> now, you, you guys did right. I wanted yeah. to see The Fugitive again. It's It was my first time watching it for many, many years. So it was okay. a great reason to, to reacquaint myself. Yeah, this was actually my first time watching it ever. Same. Ever. Ever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah same. Wow. I just never managed to uh, to sit down with it before. Can I ask you how old you both are? Like <laughs> like for the purposes of like a uh, comparison because I'm 44, which means I I'm almost positive I saw this movie in the theater. I was 14. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. were you old enough to see this in the theater? I was 8 when this came out in theaters. Yeah, yeah I was so. 7. <laughs> so you'd need to have really cool parents for that to have happened, right? Yeah. yeah. For sure. I have definitely not cool parents. Period. Yeah. So, uh-huh. <laughs> I went and saw Batman '89 in theaters. That was that's like one of my very first memories. Uh, wow! Just at that, all, what a great first memory watching <laughs> Bruce Wayne's parents die in an alley. <laughs> I remember wow. very little about the movie, but I remember my mom made my dad go see it without me because it was rated R. But I yeah. really was really into Batman, and uh, I remember him coming home and saying that it was okay, and that yeah. is like the fundamental moment of happiness of my youth. Like, it is the bar. I bet McDonald's had a lot to do with that. Do you remember how pervasive the marketing was, especially in fast food for movies like that? And I feel like 
Batman specifically was like way into McDonald's. And if you were a little kid, that was the only place you ever wanted to eat. Mm-hmm. And you were collecting those those plastic Batman cups. At least I was. Yeah. Like, how could you not get your parents to take you to that? Exactly. No, that's for sure a thing. That was, I mean, fast food. I had the Disney cups from Burger King as a kid. Mm-hmm. I had some Star Trek ones from, I remember I, those. God, I think it was Search for Spock. I don't even think I was born when that movie came out. Yeah. But I remember the cups. Yeah. Who can forget? Uh, ben and I, my co-host on Greatest Trek and Greatest Gen, we try to go and get those cups, those fast food cups, and take them on tour with us. Mm-hmm. Because when we do our live shows, we're we're doing movies, and mm-hmm. we try to bring along the cups that <laughs> were in fast food franchises when those movies were in theaters. And we've done a pretty good yeah. job so far in being able to source those. Nice. You got them for uh, Final Frontier yet? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Because you're- Got them ready fantastic. to go. Yep. Getting ready to go on tour here soon. That's right. Uh, what's that website? GreatestGenTour.com is where you can see all the tour dates and get tickets. Fantastic. And then you've also got a, a merch store for your podcast as well if you want to go ahead and throw a, a plug That's in right. for that. That's right. Podshop.biz was not taken when we needed a <laughs> merch store. <laughs> go figure. And so we scooped it up, and now it's ours. And now it's where we sell weird joke shirts and logo apparel and glasses and headbands <laughs> and all the rest. It's It's amazing. I'm glad we finally have a cool store. It is cool. Yeah, if you need a niche joke shirt, <laughs> yeah, that's the place to be. A William Carlos Williams pair of swim trunks. Right. That's the source. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie starts off with some real dramatic titles for these actors' names. I don't remember Indeed. another movie doing something like this. Two cards for each lead actor. Yeah. With the full on... It's just so dramatic. Before this movie even begins, they're laying it on thick. I mean, that's that's one of the great things about The Fugitive, right? Is like the pace of it is pretty breakneck for like the first 90 minutes. And then I would argue like by the time we get there, it really runs out of steam about 90 minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I did a, some cursory research. We don't do a lot of research on our show either. Uh-huh. Uh, but I did a little cursory research and found out that this was originally a TV show. And I was like, okay, I see that because there's so much happening and you're, you're not clear on like what day it is in this movie. Right. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. In a TV show, this would be a lot longer like lead up. Place is far more important than time in this movie for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. They do a really good job of establishing that constantly too. Whenever they're at a place... Tommy Lee's barking out the perimeter, how many miles, the distance traveled and stuff. Mm-hmm. The, the movie does a really good job of keeping that and then being consistent with it, too. Right. Do you think we're supposed to like the Tommy Lee Jones character as much as the Harrison Ford character? I think like, in Because I really got heat vibes from this movie, right? Like <laughs> the yeah. De Niro versus pacino ification of the two leads. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh... I think that Tommy Lee's character not caring about justice and just caring about being a cop plays a lot better in 1993 than it does in 2023. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. He's kind of terrifying in some scenes. For yeah. sure. Did uh, Was anybody else surprised that Tommy Lee Jones is younger than Harrison Ford? <laughs> what? That is, that's hard Harris- to believe. Harrison Ford is 80 years old, uh-huh. and Tommy Lee Jones is 76. Yeah. <laughs> They're close. I mean, I would imagine they would have gone to the same high school or whatever. So, <laughs> Yeah. My husband was like, how is he not 90? <laughs> yeah, he's got some real city miles on him for sure. It's not the years, honey. It's the mileage. He has, he has a face, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of liked Tommy Lee Jones, though. I know that... They're trying to play him as uh, the the foil, right? But mm-hmm. his folksy demeanor really made me laugh. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I liked him too. I didn't like how he treated his coworkers, though. He well, seemed no. like a dick manager. <laughs> <laughs> he has bad boss vibes, 100%. Yeah. 
So when we actually start getting into the story of this movie, it starts with a news reporter giving us the backstory as Harrison Ford gets taken to a car. Uh, we get a name, Dr. Richard Kimball. We learn he's a surgeon. We his wife was murdered. And they spent the evening at a fundraiser for the Nondescript Children's Research Fund. Mm -hmm. And then we get a literal flashback to earlier in the evening. This was such a good shot. The, the camera flash whiting out the screen to the flashback was so slick. I really liked it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's flashback is the only place that Celia Ward appears in this movie. Like she's never alive yeah. for real in the movie's timeline. Mm -hmm. Thought that was yeah. interesting. She's Celia already Ward's gone. great in this movie. She doesn't get a whole lot to do, but like, lest we forget, she was a big star back in the early 90s. This children's fundraiser is, of course, complete with a jungle print swimsuit fashion show. Yeah. What the actual <laughs> hell is going on here? <laughs> this was so bizarre. You know, it's your classic swimwear fashion show fundraiser. <laughs> Everybody does those. You've never been, Jafar? No. For kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Harrison Ford gets a call to go to the hospital to help with surgery on his literal car phone, which just... Remembering those existed aged me significantly. Yeah, I do remember the bag phone. <laughs> Are you allowed to do surgery after you've been partying? Because he doesn't disclose that on the phone. Because they're like, hey, doctor, like we need we need you to help on one. And I think maybe that's the reason why they don't care. Is like he was just there to assist, right? He's not yeah. there to like be the main surgeon. Was he drinking at all? I don't even remember... I should have I mean, paid attention. It's a fundraiser. You drink if you were going to a children's <laughs> hospital fundraiser featuring like animal print runway walks. <laughs> it's the only way I'm getting through that. Fair Look, enough. one thing I got out of this movie was that in the '90s you could get away with a lot more. Yeah, there is a <laughs> lot that would not happen today. <laughs> I know we're all used to seeing Harrison Ford look a certain way, and I think that certain way is without a beard. So, yeah. like when they introduce mm -hmm. him as bearded Harrison Ford, I think it really, like Star Trek does this a lot, right? Like we're introduced to an alien of the week that's like been through a horrible accident and they're disfigured. Mm -hmm. And then not long after, like they're cured or helped or whatever. And all of that mm -hmm. loaf is removed and they're revealed to be a beautiful person. <laughs> I think, I think that very crucially is what's happening with Harrison Ford here. Because if you're if you're making a movie starring Harrison Ford, you don't want to cover up his face with that beard. You yeah. want to get that thing shaven off as soon as possible. Finally, I'm a beautiful butterfly. Yeah. For sure. He is... Yeah, you can't have him grow the beard to be not <laughs> recognizable. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Like, he looks more like a fugitive in the beginning of this movie than at yes. the end. Yes. <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> uh, we see him answering questions at the station. They're asking lots of stuff, like no random calls to the house. They ask about the fight at the apartment, the security system, the gun they own and where it's kept. The police have clearly made up their minds at this point. They say they found his skin under her nails. I had to mm. check this. DNA testing was around back then, but it was limited to blood and took six to eight weeks to process. Hmm. Dang. So. So do you think it was a bluff by the investigators? I think it was just the cops being lazy. Huh. Mm -hmm. I would have asked yeah. why the Kimballs keep a stone bocce ball on the nightstand. <laughs> that seems suspicious to me. Why you never would you know ever where you're do that? need to wake up and club somebody with yeah. the bocce yeah. ball. Bad idea. Yeah. We move to a court case pretty quickly where the judge is putting it all together. No forcible entry was found. Someone had the key in the code. We see the attack as Richard gets home. They play the 911 phone call, and she does say Richard's name. Mm -hmm. But I have to wonder, we don't see it here. What the hell is his lawyer doing? Yeah. <laughs> Why does he call this guy for help later? He was not super helpful, clearly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he did, he, I mean, I'm sure he didn't actively or rather passively just sit through all of this like we are led to believe through the way that this is all cut up and shown to mm -hmm. us. But you have to at least offer some kind of counter argument to that. Yeah. 
Helen Kimball did her husband dirty, though. Like, if you know you're about to die, <laughs> you can't say who is innocent into yeah. the phone. Yeah. That would be so upsetting. Like, I wouldn't want to be angry at my wife at the very end for doing that, but I have to admit, I would be pretty upset that, <laughs> yeah. that she would put me in that position by saying my name last. <laughs> yeah. We don't even get so many of that uh, sweet, sweet yelling of objection that I'm so looking forward to in every court scene ever. Yeah. How about we are, like, in the first 13 minutes, like, death penalty. Like, yeah. that's how fast this movie goes. The credits uh-huh. are still rolling when he's yeah. in prison. <laughs> yeah. Where are all his doctor friends in the courtroom, too? Like, all these people who claim to like and support him. Like, I would have loved to have a Jane Lynch cutaway or something, like, <laughs> in the gallery. Yeah, mm-hmm. anything. Yeah. Ain't got time for that. Yeah. The first half no. of this movie's got to run real quick. Mm-hmm. Once we get to the prison scene, did anybody recognize the mustache man? The uh, deputy with the mustache who's helping take Harrison Ford off to prison? Warden Was that the Walt Richard Real? Yeah. Yes, Richard Real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's the jump to conclusions guy from Office Space. That's where I remembered him. So great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great to see him. I was almost positive I saw John C. Riley in this movie, too, as an uncredited random police officer, but I couldn't confirm this. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I was aghast that the death penalty was on the table in 1993. And then oh, I did yeah. some research and whoo, <laughs> everything's on the table in 93. <laughs> Everything's still on the table in Oklahoma. <laughs> Everything's still on the table in like 35 states. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That was <laughs> shocking. Yeah. I really love how good Harrison Ford is. Like, I don't think you ever see him break really except for two times, right? Once is like when he thinks that the police have finally caught him when he's living in the basement of that Russian lady's house yes, and then yes. instead they're <laughs> catching his kid and you see him like exhale and like almost break there. Mm -hmm. But did you notice like that wild micro expression he has on the prison bus where he, he like does that cool Hollywood lip quiver thing. Like you can tell he's scared to be on the bus, but he's holding it together somehow. Mm -hmm. I love that part of this movie. And, and that's like, like Harrison Ford is great for so many things, but I feel like people don't often think about like all the little stuff Harrison Ford does that makes him a great actor. And I think that's one of the things for sure. Yeah. He's fantastic. Speaking of the bus, do we think that Richard Kimball knew they were going to pull this? Do we think that he was in on the whole thing? Because he's looking around at the other inmates and they're looking Mm -hmm. around at each other. Like it kind of seems like maybe he's caught in the middle of a situation where everyone else knows what's going on. And he's just trying to act as if he's not going to blow it for them. Right. Right. <laughs> Here I was just paying attention to their color-coded prison outfits, wondering what gangs they belonged in or if they're crime-coded or what. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so the, on the field trip here to Menard Prison, they trick the guard, accidentally kill the driver, and this bus just turns into a gag from Hot Rod. Oh. <laughs> This was it. Like, this was the big action explosion set piece of the entire film. Yeah. And it happens in the first it was. 20 minutes of the movie, right? Kind of amazing. The thing that bothered me about this whole thing is the bus somehow goes from parallel to perpendicular to be hit by the train. Oh. <laughs> and I know it's like the stupidest detail, and they do a really good job of all of the details in this movie. Like when we see the overhead of the ditch and the highway and everything, it all kind of comes together, except that the train is, well, the bus is facing the wrong way to be hit by the train somehow. Yeah. And I. They're it, counting on it moving too fast, and you don't notice. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You're a stickler for bus direction continuity. I get that. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a vice, really. But we're... How scary, like, as scary as the bus getting hit by the train was, the perspective of Kimball running at camera with the train behind him, like, <laughs> like gouging out the earth, I thought was a 10 out of 10 amazing shot. Like, it's beautiful. that is breathtaking. 
that's a a shot kind that he's familiar with as you know Indiana Jones. Right. Yeah. The uh, train is the rolling boulder, basically. Yeah. I'm a doctor, not an historian. Harrison survives diving under a bridge, mostly unscathed. He has like a little side puncture, but it's not mm -hmm. too bad. I mean, he runs for like 12 hours afterwards. So right. how bad could it possibly be? It seems like every freight train nowadays carries like a dangerous toxic chemical. He's really <laughs> lucky he wasn't just liquefied inside yeah. chlorine underneath that bridge. Yeah. Yeah. My first instinct when I, the train derailed was like, mm, do trains just explode like that? And then yeah. I thought about the last two months. And maybe they do. I don't know. There's yeah. no way 20 years later, if they were to make this movie, that train doesn't explode all the way. Yeah. And take out half a forest. Right. One of his uh, fellow prisoners helps Kimball out and then tells him to go any way but the way he's going. And as he runs, Tommy Lee arrives on site, U.S. Marshal Samuel Gerard. He finds the local sheriff, assuming everyone is dead, and he's a bit of a dick about it who's just like, fine, I'm taking over the investigation. And what follows is an atypical reaction for media, but honestly, exactly what I would do if I was the sheriff and a U.S. Marshal showed up, which is just, fuck it, it's your mess. <laughs> Every yeah, other I mean, time we see this. It's probably a Friday. <laughs> no one wants to be there any longer yeah. than they have to be. Yeah. Yeah, this is the Fed's problem now. Peace, boys. It's a few days before St. Patrick's Day. You gotta, you gotta, yeah. you gotta get all the the whiskey and beer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of those moments I had in this movie where I realized, like, even though I had never seen this movie, and I had discovered I've actually only ever seen two non Lucasfilm Harrison Ford movies, I was still familiar with the like zeitgeist around it because I've definitely heard the hen house, outhouse, doghouse quote before. Like, mm -hmm. I knew that yeah it's timeless yeah great line it's what they're going to play like when when tommy lee dies and the academy awards do the in memoriam like how could that not be his yeah. his clip yeah that's going to be sure. tied to him forever uh, they immediately find a leg restraint without legs starting the manhunt tommy lee sets the speed distance traversable and where the checkpoints will be immediately giving us a kind of frame of reference of motion for the next bit of this movie. What if those leg restraints had legs, though? <laughs> Just legs? That'd make, this, that'd make this hard R, right? Yeah. Because this was at a time where, like, PG-13 was still uh, yeah. a little exotic. You don't yeah. know what you're going to be able to see in PG-13. Maybe you see legs in shackles, and that's it. Kalima. Kalima. <laughs> yeah, I was like, could I watch this movie with my son? I don't know. It says PG-13, but I'm going to go with no. <laughs> yeah, safe bet. Kimball runs until the next morning where he finds a medical facility where he treats himself. Uh, he manages to hide from a nurse behind a door, changes clothes, shaves, and talks to a cop on his way out. Oh, the slick move here. You're going to just skip over the giant egg salad sandwich he eats <laughs> off of that old man's tray table? I was wondering how this old man was supposed to eat in that neck brace, like, by I himself. Love, I love that this movie did that, because so often movies play the fantasy of how many bullets were in that clip, or like, when does he have time to sleep or eat or whatever? Like, actually giving us an eating scene I thought was great at this moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah he needs those calories. That old man dies of malnutrition, though. Like that's oh, yeah. that's the sad part. She did say he needed to eat for his strength. Yeah. See, uh, that's rough. It's too bad. Yeah, I mean, Doctor Kimball saves so many, but he did he did murder that guy <laughs> through malnutrition. He manages a body count of one. Yeah, that this whole guy. movie. <laughs> uh huh. He talks to a cop on his way out, and he's all like, he did, he asks for the description. The cop describes the dude he's looking at. He's all like, oh, look in a mirror. <laughs> Just walks away. Yeah, because he's too busy looking at Harrison Ford's crank <laughs> sticking out of his zipper, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> he 
helps the guard he saved out of an ambulance before he lifts the ambulance. And then we cut over to Tommy Lee's camp. Oh, I was just going to say, I wish we saw more of this this uh, guard, right? Like, where's the bedside interview with him? Like, where's the follow-up with him? I kind of wanted to live with that character a bit more. There is a little yeah. bit of that from a lot of characters in this movie, especially this first half where it's just moving so quick. Mm-hmm. After we cut over to Tommy Lee's camp, we, hey, I know this guy. And, hey, look, it's Joe Pantoliano getting some screen time. Uh, to borrow your parlance, he's real that guy. He is. I, everyone has gone through a costume change here in camp. Everyone's getting a little comfortable mm-hmm. at base yeah. camp. We like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. U.S. Marshals really dress up most <laughs> of the time. That's what I gathered from this movie. Shirts and ties. Yeah. yeah. Is there some pressure as being feds that you got to like look Yeah, bigger, like you want to distinguish yourself from the local police or whatever. And, the, yeah. and for that, you go to L.L. Bean. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. We cut over to Harrison Ford driving his real notable escape car, the ambulance. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, They have a sighting and everyone loads into the helicopter to give chase. They find him. He dodges cop cars. He gets into a tunnel as the helicopter lays down at one end to close it off. He runs out of the ambulance as they approach, makes it to a sewer drain. So everyone's just this this movie so quick. Mm-hmm. You know, so they're following. They're like 20 feet behind him at all points, and we're cutting back and forth. And we see them follow him down the sewer drain. He tosses his coat down one end of a Y to try and get them to follow, but the marshals just Scooby Do it and split up anyways. Is wearing a thick cable knit sweater the very worst thing you could be wearing in a sewer? <laughs> yeah, it has to be so right. Heavy. Yeah. Ugh. You know that thing's never absorbent. getting clean. <laughs> yeah. I think at one point he falls in the water and at the next scene I'm like, that thing shouldn't be that dry. <laughs> yeah. It shouldn't be that dry. <laughs> uh, Tommy Lee is hot on his trail. Uh, he slips. Harrison gets his gun. Harrison Ford says that he didn't kill his wife. And Tommy Lee's famous response, I don't care. What an asshole. <laughs> but it's also the perfect description for his entire professional mission. For like, sure. It's not... His job to right. adjudicate, it's his job to arrest yeah. and apprehend. Definitely. Like, he's definitely doing his job, and, and his actions are not outside the bounds of that. How many guns do you think he has on his body, though? Three. He has that secret yeah. gun under the Velcro. I thought that was a hot move. You got to have one down at the foot, right? Oh, down for sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, he's at least got three on him. I think Dr. Kimball's cable knit sweater is so covered in sewage that jumping off of the dam into the clean water below has got to be like attractive right it's not just (laughs) fleeing tommy lee jones's character it's like the only way to get clean is to die or to jump into the water below (laughs) yeah yeah that thing's got to be really heavy though it's amazing he doesn't drown yeah yeah I mean, that's like the science experiment, right? Like the the rate of falling of like a bowling ball or a feather is supposed to be the same. Uh-huh. But like mm-hmm. a bowling ball, a feather, and a cable knit sweater waterlogged with sewage. <laughs> yeah. Like that falls the same also. Yeah. <laughs> right. This has got to be what? You think, is it the most famous scene of a movie from the 90s? I mean, Jurassic Park being this yeah. very same year. Like, okay. I looked up That's a good call. all the great movies from 93. 93 was a... Can I curse on this show? Oh, fuck yeah. Yes, absolutely. 93 was a fucking killer year for movies. <laughs> like, there were so many good movies in 93. I think, I think it's kind of unfortunate that The Fugitive is as good as it is, and I don't think it will be remembered as maybe even the top three best movie of this year. Like, there's a yeah. lot of good ones in it. What were some of those others besides Jurassic Park? Tombstone was one of them. Oh, was Tombstone uh, 93? Menace to Society. Now I'm now I'm going to have to look them up. But uh, like The Sandlot was 93. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Like really memorable films. The Firm. Oh, you remember yeah. The Firm, right? And Pelican Brief. Mm-hmm. Man. Okay. Yeah. There you go. There's a lot going on in 93. There's a selection. Uh, after this jump, most of the marshals assume that he's dead. And Tommy Lee's just said, well, that will make him easy to find. Yeah. They're, the deputies are like, he was just covered in sewage. He <laughs> probably wanted to kill himself. 
Yeah. <laughs> He's dead. <laughs> Tommy Lee sets new parameters around the last known location. Kimball runs until he can't. And we get some flashbacks that start sexy before turning tragic. Yeah. yeah. Helen Kimball seems like a really cool wife, you know? Yeah. Like, keeping mm-hmm. the fire alive between she and Richard. Like, they seem good for each other. Yeah. Like, like that's what these scenes do. Like, they make her death a real tragedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, he gets called away to uh, go do surgery after their nice date. And she's still, like, setting out the alcohol. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Throws pedals. pedals. He's definitely going to want to get hammered after cardiothoracic surgery. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing washes blood off like champagne, right? <laughs> right. That's the thing, yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> he wakes up in a pile of leaves. He makes his way out, and we see the U.S. Marshals get on a plane because they've got a lead on the other escapee. The Marshals conduct a no-knock raid and find the other escapes fugitive. Uh, he grabs one of the Marshals and then gets executed by Tabby Lee. Yeah, this feels real bad, doesn't it, guys? I mean, it's real cold blooded. Yeah. And I think everyone knows it. Like, people in the scene know it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just like modern people looking at a past movie and going, like, oh, that's gross and contemptible for for its time. Like, in its time, it was contemptible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He he points the gun at the, the black lady that's in there, and I'm just like, oh, God, no. <laughs> this is a little too yeah. contemporary. Yeah. The interesting yeah. consequence of this scene is how it changes Newman, right? Because Newman and like everyone else who's a marshal are like dressed as hobos from the neighborhood mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. storming the house and like Newman's gross hair is hanging down like he looks he looks totally strung out and then yeah. like from this scene on he is so buttoned up and cleaned up like it feels like that that costume change is part of what is telling us that he has changed, like as a mm-hmm. personality. Like you'll notice, he doesn't really do a bunch of joking around from this point forward either. Like mm-hmm. it's almost like he's Tommy Lee Jones's like lieutenant, like his main guy from here on out. Like yeah, he really takes his job and his life seriously after this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tommy Lee Jones doesn't change from here, though. No. I don't think Tommy Lee Jones changes at all in this movie. He, he yeah. definitively doesn't. Even at the end, yeah. when there's a glimmer of him changing, he makes yeah. Harrison Ford swear to secrecy that he won't tell anyone. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I am definitely not changing. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Richard has made his way back to Chicago, where he calls his lawyer like a big idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to call Jane Lynch. Right? Call anyone but, but the lawyer. Yeah, he wasn't very helpful before. Why will he be helpful now? Mm -hmm. (laughs) With all that money, you'd think he would have been able to afford better counsel. Exactly. He ambushes his friend Chris Nichols for cash while the marshals pull back to let him relax and hence reveal himself. They also start to dig into his wife's murder, assuming that that's the reason he came back to Chicago. Nichols has got a great haircut, right? Like the great (laughs) early 90s haircut that Mm -hmm. looks like it's plastic. Yeah. yeah, just so much gel. It's just frozen in place. I think he's kind of reverse Kimballing here because like in the way Richard Kimball starts bearded and disheveled and then gets cleaned up and looking like Harrison uh-huh. Ford as the movie goes, like you need Dr. Nichols to look super cleaned up in the beginning in order to like show him getting the shit kicked out of him at the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we even see him in this BMW. Yeah. yeah. Nichols has... A kind of an accent, right? Yeah, he's played by, I think, a Norwegian actor. Okay. Hmm. I couldn't place it at all, but it reminded me of that thing that we kind of have in other 90s movies, uh, 90s action movies, that we have that sort of um, foreign villain. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. Die Hard doing it famously. Yeah. Yeah, was that the tip? Like, <laughs> in that yeah. 90s movie kind of way? Like, should we have known that yeah. he was evil? For his non-specific Norwegian accent. (laughs) (laughs) The cops are drawn in to help the search here. And I got to ask, did you see the the sketches they had of Harrison Ford next to the police chief as he was instructing the officers? 
No, I didn't catch that part. I missed that. They are miserable. They look nothing like Harrison Ford. And you've got got to be one of the most recognizable faces on Earth in 1993. Yeah. yeah. Like, if you get 10 random human beings who are alive on planet Earth in 1993, no matter where they are, at least half of them are going to be able to pull Harrison Ford out of a lineup. Is that a commentary on how useless police sketches are? Because I feel like there's been <laughs> research on this that... Like trying to recreate somebody's face for a police sketch is not famously not accurate. They have photos. They have photos yeah, of yeah. him the entire movie. Like when they get off the train, they've got photos when there's of a him. Photo, there's no need for sketch. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like they drew him without the beard, and all of a sudden his chin is just a straight triangle. Yeah. What if his hair were dyed black, though? <laughs> He'd be unrecognizable. Isn't it crazy how little that hair dye lasts? Like, yes. I'm not a person who's ever dyed my hair, but like, I don't, I think it's supposed to last longer than a day, right? Yeah. Because yeah. it's black on, I mean, <laughs> on day one. But then he's like back to Harrison Ford, light brown the very next day. We do know, I mean, a year takes place over the course of this movie. Yeah, they do, yeah. they do say that towards the end. What? Yeah, from the yeah, start of the trial. I thought that was the about trial. the length of the trial, but but like as a fugitive, I thought it was just a couple of days. Well, they I don't. Think it's more. We definitely get some time passed when he's on the run, but it's it's hard to say. Like I swear, I was paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> this movie just goes that fast. Like who knows? Yeah. Yeah. He must have bought the cheap dye though. Like right. that, that box stuff that doesn't last if you don't take care of it. You got to use the right shampoo, something mm-hmm. gentle, no sulfates. You but, know what? Yeah. When he got that room from the Russian family, you probably don't want to get hair dye all over the sheets and stuff. Mm. Yeah. So maybe he yeah. went and he washed it out yeah. before living there. Yeah. It'd be very courteous. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's a thoughtful house guest. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Kimball makes his way to his old hospital. He heads to the prosthetics lab and uh, starts setting up a fake identity to pose as a janitor here. He steals a badge so that he can get his own photo and put it on it, gets a uniform and stuff. All we ever see him clean are blinds, though. <laughs> I want to see I want to see Harrison Ford cleaning a fucking row of urinals <laughs> and, and picking chewed gum out of them, you know? Yeah. Let's add another hour to this runtime. Really slow it down here. Just here. Give us that scene. It's possible to root for Harrison Ford more if we just show him doing janitorial work. Yeah. Yeah. Ally him with the common man instead Mm -hmm. of the ultra wealthy surgeon who's also married to someone even wealthier than he is. Yeah. Yeah. The marshals are interviewing Dr. Nichols when he tells them that he saw Richard this morning and gave him some cash. And then we have an interview with Jane fucking Lynch. And what if I were to just innocently murder you, Will? I'd still have to go to trial. Probably get off with justifiable homicide. We see a montage of both investigations into the murder, Richards and Sam's. And we finally get a look at our killer. It's Andreas. Hey. Yeah, about time. And this is when he wakes up just in time for the police raid. This is a great fake out. I I was Mm -hmm. completely just like, oh, he's screwed. As all the cops Mm -hmm. are surrounding the place. And then there's, find out we're just there for the landlord's son, who... Good restraint by him, not busting out the door and, and trying to run for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I learned a lot about fleeing the police from this movie. I'm sure yeah, that right? is actually useful information. Uh, uh-huh. So, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Kimball uses the computer in the prosthetics lab to narrow down his list to five people, uh, while the arrested son gives up Kimball's location. And then Tommy Lee starts to go through his clothes, looking for clues. the hell is this? My dirty undies, dude. Laundry. The whites. It's kind of wild how Kimball is dressed appropriately for Midwest winter a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point, he stops being well-dressed for winter. And he's just like just wearing a tweed blazer with the neck Mm -hmm. lifted up. Yeah. And it's like March. In Chicago uh-huh. at night, and that's all he's wearing? <laughs> to me, that's conspicuous. <laughs> See, I only know weather from the South, so I'm like, that seems fine. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it just seems too cold for that blazer. Yeah, you're probably right. Might be. Dr. Julianne Moore gets Harrison to take a patient down to observation, and he adjusts a file as the kid's going down, saving his life. So heroic, it just costs him this cover as the marshals arrive. Yeah. It's a great scene that makes you love Kimball even more, but yeah. like, how great is it seeing Julianne Moore? Right. In, uh-huh. I mean, it's not a cameo, but it's she's just great in everything. It's true. I thought when we had the scene that we were setting her up to be something. Yeah. Like she was going to come back in some sort of way or, or ally with Richard Kimball. And then I mean, Julianne Moore was capital J, capital M, Julianne Moore in 1993. Like it's not, uh-huh. like I think that was a good expectation to have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's in the lead credits. So, oh, so it's yeah. not even like they considered it a bit part for the movie or anything. Yeah. Tommy Lee spends some time in the prosthetics ward following up on what he thinks Harrison Ford is following up on. His list is 47 names, but he also has, you know, a whole bunch more people to look into stuff. Yeah. Uh, I love these computers that they're doing their search on. <laughs> like, nice to know that they were that high powered back then. Good. Uh, as an information technology professional, I can promise you that that computer is still running in a hospital basement somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's stable as hell. Untouched by time. It's an mm-hmm. IBM AS400. Those things run for forever. Yeah. Don't make them like that anymore. Nope. After this, we see the Green River running in Chicago, which means it's St. Patrick's Day. Mm-hmm. If you're unaware, this is a thing that does actually happen every year still. Mm-hmm. It is apparently not terrible for the river. They do it with oranges. And it costs about $2,000 to dye the river red. Green? Green. Fuck. Words. (laughs) Uh. (laughs) More costly to dye it red, I think. Probably. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) An uncountable cost, even. Uh. Kimball continues narrowing down his list of five. Uh, He visits an inmate. Takes him off the list as a guard IDs him. He starts to make his way down the stairs, but the federal marshals are already here. They just almost miss each other, and then Tom Ely realizes, turns okay. around, shouts his name down the stairs, and when he looks up, he knows he's been made. Yeah. What a boss move. Just yell the dude's name and wait for him to turn. Like, this could have, if, it, if just an ounce more restraint, he could have just kept going and ignored it been fine tommy lee jones feels so bad about losing his guy here that he just shoots and shoots and shoots in the (laughs) lobby scene that follows into the bulletproof glass yeah Yeah. (laughs) not dangerous at all wow what a moment i thought for sure that he'd shoot his foot Mm -hmm. if you look i mean the bullets were all very well aimed like the way the Mm -hmm. shots organized we see the bullet impacts right where Harrison Ford's head is on the other side. Yeah. He's just fine. And it's very jarring. And it takes a minute to even consider the foot as a target. Oh, so you think you think that if he wanted to shoot his foot, he would have? I th- And he chose not to? I think he thought <laughs> he didn't realize the foot was an option. He was too focused on the head and chest. Like, uh. I know. God, what movie was that? I think that was like True Romance where James Gandolfini gets the top of his foot stabbed with a knife. Like, we've seen foot trauma in action films before, Mm -hmm. Uh but I don't know if I've ever seen, like, a foot held out with the heel and to have that be shot. That would have been an amazing... That would be more memorable than outhouse, hen house, chicken house. (laughs) Seeing seeing a gun shoot the heel of a foot. Yeah. That's a a smaller target, though. Yeah. Like, that's some trick shooting. Yeah, I mean, I think you... I think he regrets not shooting the foot because when he disappears in the parade, I mean, yeah. how many times does Tommy Lee Jones lose Kimball in a crowd? All the yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. He's wily. We get a really embarrassing press conference yes. after that. Yeah, why even have this press conference if you're Tommy Lee Jones, right? Right. You have a, you have a choice, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's so sad in answering these questions, if he answers them at all. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's a... Uh... It's tough. I mean, I imagine you have to just because there were 
live fire at the St. Patrick's Day parade. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is the Tommy Lee Jones you hope to get in if if you're casting No Country for Old Men, the really brief cards close to the vest Tommy Lee Jones in dialogue kind of version of him. Mm-hmm. Like uh-huh. this seems like that character a little bit. Yeah. Kimball starts to stake out in front of his next name on the list. He sees some police waiting outside, too. He dodges them, but he does ID Andreas from the photos on the wall. He finds photos with one of the doctors and check stubs from a pharmaceutical company. He calls the marshals, letting them trace the call as he takes out evidence and just leaves stuff on the table for them to find and leaves the phone off the hook for them to finish the trace while he starts to leave. Sykes comes home to a pile of police while Gerard questions Sykes, who was investigated for the murder a year ago and has 15 witnesses to his alibi. Yeah. That is a ton. Have you heard the term clothes horse before? Cause when I have, I have not. When, uh, when one of the, one of the detectives rolls through Sykes's house and you see like all of the racks of clothes, that's what she calls Sykes. I'd never heard that before. Yeah. I've heard is that, that just a, a person who enjoys clothes or has uh-huh. a lot of clothes? That's how I've understood the context. Yeah. Uh-huh. Is that an old timey like, phrase or do people actually say that? I mean, I've I've definitely heard a few, you know, a friend or two referred to as a clothes horse. Somebody who's very fashionable, had a huh. lot of a lot of stuff in their closet. Do you think Sykes uh, is fashionable? Well, okay, this <laughs> is nineteen ninety three, right? So Yeah. Maybe? Question yeah. mark? Don't yeah. really remember that, but <laughs> <laughs> he does have a fancy trench coat toward the end. He does. The thing that got me about Sykes and Jafer having seen Babylon Five, maybe yeah. this was you too. Obviously, Adam, you don't have any context. To None that, at all. But <laughs> <laughs> doesn't he sound so different, not affecting his voice and accent that he does for Babylon Five? For sure. Yeah, he sounds well human. Yeah, but yeah, it's just is it completely. Uh, well, completely alien to me to hear his voice like that. I know. I was like, I can't believe it. This is what he sounds like, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, presume yeah. I mean, I have to find an interview, but yeah. Yeah. We find out he's security for the pharmaceutical company, right? Mm-hmm. That is an interesting choice to employ a one-armed man in your bodyguard security. I don't want to be ableist here, but it seems like that might affect your ability to say lift 50 pounds <laughs> yeah that's what my job my job descriptions always say must be able to lift 50 pounds or whatever <laughs> the vibe i got from it was that he was more of a planning person than a physical bodyguard person mm, mm. okay handles like their home security and systems and stuff he's like the manager yeah okay but that was conjecture i thought he was out there so. bodyguarding because he's doing their dirty work so yeah. <laughs> but if he's if he is there for all these execs, why wasn't he in town for their giant fundraiser? <laughs> was yeah, was the thing question. that bothered me immediately, where it's just all like, where were all of these people, if not at the swanky party you throw to have a swanky party as a corporation? Yeah. Yeah. He was in the lot parking cars. Yep. <laughs> right. Kimball calls Dr. Nichols again to ask about Dr. Lentz, who's the doctor from the photos. It's at this point that Campbell puts it all together that this is a plot from Big Pharma. Mm -hmm. That they were the two doctors that were looking into this drug. The marshals ask Dr. Nichols about one of the photos when they catch him at the conference. And he says he doesn't know Sykes or Lentz, which will be Mm -hmm. important in a little bit. Cops are camped outside Sykes as he gets a phone call that is oh so mysterious. (laughs) He grabs a pistol, puts on a real nice trench coat and heads out as Richard collects more evidence on his wife's murderer. Dr. Jane Lynch confirms all the liver samples were from the same person, thus proving the drug was harmful after all, and that someone had altered all of this evidence. Meanwhile, two of the marshals are digging around at the hospital while Sykes is looking on from the shadows. I am mm. a sucker for a good hiding in the shadows cut that we, like we get here. It's just one of my favorite things. It's why uh, John Carpenter's Halloween is one of my favorite movies. It's because that movie sure. is just, hey, what if we did cool cuts from the shadows, but made it a whole fucking movie? Yeah. <laughs> just absolutely love it. 
The marshals turn the hospital upside down, so as has Sykes has, who sees Kimbo leave and then pursues them to get on the L. This is a classic old man fight scene. Like, <laughs> Harrison Ford is so good at this, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it, like a credible fight scene for an older man. That's what this looks like. There's, like, uh-huh. it's not, it's not two old guys like trading, right hooks. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. they're barely landing anything. They're just kind of rolling around. They're like getting shoved into uh, grab handles and stuff. It's great. It looks totally plausible. Yeah. Harrison Ford was what, mid 40s at this time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Andreas would have been 50s? 50s? Yeah. But Andreas yeah. seems like he's got weight on Harrison Ford. Like, yeah. He's a tall yeah. guy. I mean, I don't know whether or not Sykes could fight Kimball with one arm tied behind his back like he does, <laughs> though. That might, that might even the odds. Bit. <laughs> right, right. With respect to their ages. Yep. Mm-hmm. And this is really, this is when the movie picks up into gear again. We kind of had a lull for the last 20, 30 minutes, and we resume a similar breakneck pace from here on out. The marshals start looking for Nichols and Sykes. On the train, a passenger IDs Kimball, uh-huh. which gets the cop to come, which starts this fight. Sykes does kill a cop. They assume that it was Kimball, despite Sykes being handcuffed there. Right. Uh, knocked out. Uh, so now the cops are out for Kimball and looking for blood as well. We find out Dr. Nichols, as he's speaking at this conference, has been appointed to the board of that $7 billion a year company. Just because I can't do one of these movie episodes without our listeners expecting some math. That is $14.7 <laughs> billion adjusted for inflation from 1993. Wow. Which still doesn't seem like that much these days i don't know we've what is the market capitalization of apple is like a trillion dollars now or something there's like a handful of very 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 large companies that kind of act as outliers there i mean a 14 billion dollar company is still probably within the fortune top 100 yeah okay anyways kimball crashes this convention and calls out dr nichols in front of all of his colleagues is your favorite guy in the whole movie the spotlight guy during the scene? <laughs> yeah. Because I love how Harrison Ford does the confrontation and like Dr. Nichols is like, all right, fuck this. I'm getting off stage like mid speech. And he like goes off to the side to have a private conversation <laughs> and the spotlight operator follows them all the way off stage. <laughs> that guy's a total pro. Yeah. The real I hero. I admire that. I really do. The enemy was capitalism all along, guys. That also really helps production because it because the light source never changes as even as the characters are moving through the oh, okay. scene. Mm-hmm. Like that's really good from that perspective too. Yeah, those are the kind of details that I couldn't pick up on, but seem very important. <laughs> uh, they managed to remove themselves from the large audience, and Nichols attacks Kimball. The marshals arrive as the fight moves to. So the this roof. is two old man fights in one day. Oh, for, within a couple within for Doctor Kimball. Yeah, this is real close. Yeah, here. he's still Definitely. sore from Sykes. He's got to be right. One hundred percent. Right. And this fight, we're gonna go all out. Like if you have a bingo card of '90s action movie things, like we've got the helicopter now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're gonna go through a skylight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're on a like a skyscraper building. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. we it's all you got a here. Sniper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. They go through that that glass window and land in an elevator shaft. Uh with Nichols going through and landing in dirty laundry and Kimball landing on top of the elevator. Yeah, he gets it way worse, doesn't he? Oh yeah. Yeah. How sure were you that Dr. Nichols, after leaving the elevator, was going to send the elevator back up to crush <laughs> Dr. Oh Campbell? Oh, my God, right? I thought that was going to be the move. Yeah. I don't think... I mean, that's, he know that's he's up the big there? brain. Is, is Kim... Yeah, I think okay. so. Surely, right? Yeah. I mean, you were fallen. I don't know how much attention you were able to pay. <laughs> but you know he's right behind you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they make it down to the uh, fifth floor as the elevator goes down, which is the laundry floor. And 
dramatically we get all of the steam, the moving bags. What a great place to set a fight scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like using the the eye bar as a weapon against Joe Pantoliano, like that head strike on that thing yeah. looked really rough. Sure that yeah. was well a done. widow maker, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the widow maker. Gerard yells out the series of events proving Richard's innocence as Nichols is about to shoot him, but uh, Kimball kneecaps him, saves Gerard, bringing him up to three lives saved and one murder. Pretty good escape plan. That's all. Yeah. 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 yeah just that malnutrition. We see Sykes arrested. Gerard walks Kimball out and cuffs, but once they're in the car, he takes him off, hands him an ice pack as they drive off to credits. Into the sunset. What a movie. <laughs> Do you think Dr. Kimball goes back to his old job and practices medicine after this? Because you got to believe he's like acquitted or whatever. Yeah. Like, he's, right. he's going to be a free man. What happens to him? Does the board give him his license back? I assume they revoked his license when he got convicted of murder. I mean, yeah, I think that'll yeah. happen. Yeah. It might take some time. Surely. I and mean, you probably take a little bit of time to heal up. You got all those old man fights. You definitely have to move. I don't know if you could live in that condo yeah. anymore. No. no, I couldn't. Too many yeah. memories. Yeah. You definitely don't play bocce ball ever again. No. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. in fact, probably he retires in 30 years, is on a beach. Someone hands him a bocce ball. He just starts openly <laughs> weeping and no one understands why. You probably <laughs> don't use tongs in the kitchen ever either. Mm. Yeah. Too, uh, too familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I think Dr. Types, you do go back, right? Yeah, Dr. that's all Types, I know. Get, yeah. And it's clearly in him to save. He wants to save yeah. people. Right. He did a lot of that, except for the notable exception. Yeah, uh, Yeah. maybe he gets into nutrition after this. <laughs> yeah. Nutritional medicine. I could see him coming back with a vengeance and just like trying to get on the FDA board to approve drugs and just shutting evil corporations down for forever, trying mm-hmm. to make that a gig. Yeah. That would be a good turn for him. What a what a way to end a career, right? Yeah. I don't think he's remarrying though. I think the death of Helen Kimball was a tragedy and she's not replaceable. Yeah. As yeah. a as a wife for sure. Agree. Yeah, holding on to that Agree. flame for the rest of his life for sure. Yeah. 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 It's it's about time for a TV reboot on this movie, right? That's how the timeline works. It's been 30 years. It's overdue, I'd say. Has it happened? Wow. Did I miss it? Great call. <laughs> Where's my HBO it limited run? It might have run? already happened. This feels like it would have happened on CBS in the early 2000s. Yeah. Or maybe maybe it happened on a streaming platform that I'm not subscribed to, and I've just missed it. Yeah. Yeah, there's no way Hollywood doesn't remake this. They're making another fucking Won- Willy Wonka movie right now, so. Are they? Oh, yeah. Trailer dropped. It's got uh, Timothy Chagamet. Oh, fun. I like so. him. So how do you feel about this movie, Adam? It was really fun to watch it again. I haven't seen it in a long time. Like, I know I've seen it since it came out, probably a half, and do- half a dozen times. But, yeah, just a good nostalgic feeling about what great movies were like in the early 90s. And, like, I just saw the new Indiana Jones movie. I don't know if that places this recording in any time that you don't want. No, but that's no, fine. That's fine. Yeah. Just saw it over the weekend and really enjoyed the Harrison Ford performance in that. And it was just a reminder of of like how good he was 30 years ago or whatever. He's he's great. He's one of yeah. the best. I have to go see that still. Yeah, I haven't seen it either. I have a newborn. So yeah. <laughs> this is definitely a kind of movie that I wouldn't seek out on my own. Like the the horror genre, the action genre, those are two that I just generally don't look for but having watched it for this i found it a a really fun romp you know nice little 90s romp yeah no it's a great movie i will probably re-watch it in the next week or two without having to take notes and pause constantly i'll probably enjoy it a lot more in that form especially given its pace it made it very difficult Mm -hmm. just from a like podcasting perspective it's like i gotta talk about this i gotta have like nine pages of notes in front of me but I think just sitting down and watching it to watch it, I think I'm really going to like it. Yeah, this feels like the perfect happens to be on cable TV type of movie in a hotel room or something that yeah. is like, 
weird to say like would be like a comfort watch, but like uh-huh. I would absolutely watch this, you know, 30 minutes in and watch it to the end as I'm like brushing my teeth and ready to go to bed in some yeah. strange city, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll have plenty of opportunity for that coming up with the tour. That's right. So uh, you want to remind everyone where they can find you, Adam? Oh, yeah. Uh, You can listen to my shows, The Greatest Generation and Greatest Trek, both of which are on the Maximum Fun Network. Uh, They're both about Star Trek. Greatest Generation is about older Star Trek programming, and Greatest Trek is about all the new Star Trek that's coming out on the streaming services. And we're doing a live show tour at the end of August. I think it's like 16 dates, a bunch of different Mm -hmm. cities this time around. Our live shows are about Star Trek movies, and if I didn't mention it before, uh, they're comedy shows. So <laughs> yeah. if you like Star Trek, but you also like laughing about Star Trek, we're really that kind of show. So listen and subscribe and come and see us on the road. Both shows are a delight. It's true. We we love them both. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. Uh, it's the honest truth. Really enjoy both shows, have for many, many years, and uh, we'll be happy to continue to listen. Hey, thanks. Well, thanks so much for coming on. And they both have the best community. So, yeah, yeah. That's that's been uh, the best part, really, is that we've done nothing to make that community. The community just happened all on its own. It's it's been amazing to just kind of be a passenger for that. Yeah, it's a special magic. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, and thanks for being so patient. I know Laura and I talked about me being on this show last year at Star Trek Las Vegas, Mm -hmm. and I put you guys off for months and months and months, and (laughs) I just couldn't face you again at this year's Star Trek Las Vegas if I hadn't been on the show, so I'm glad to have done this. I I no longer feel guilty, Uh, and it was a a hoot. I loved uh, talking about the fugitive with you. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe someday we'll talk about Babylon 5. Maybe. I, no. I really doubt that. <laughs> I know. It's okay. We have another one of these next year. We won't ask until then. Great. Uh, <laughs> great. I'll talk to you then. Uh, oh, and uh, next week, we've got Babylon 5, Season 4, Episode 12, Conflicts of Interest. Ivanova prepares for her first Resistance broadcast. Garibaldi's former lover involves him in a potentially lethal mission. And Sheridan must unite Jakar and Wando against a new foe. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Aren't you intrigued, Adam? <laughs> it's a good show, we promise. I'm it sounds like I'm making fun, but I am I'm absolutely not. <laughs> no. All right. Well, while we're talking to people, let's say thanks to Jeremy Siegel. Jeremy composed our excellent theme music. You can find more of Jeremy's work at jeremysiegel42.bandcamp.com and also on your favorite streaming services as Nuclear Jaguar. The June album's out. Go listen to it. It's great. And thank you to Angry Duck Time Machine on Instagram for our podcast artwork. Thanks, Aaron, for editing our podcast and making sure that we sound intelligent instead of like driveling (laughs) idiots. Uh, Really appreciate you making this podcast listenable. Yeah, he's the real MVP. It's true. And then thank you to all of our fans who uh, decided to spend the last hour with Laura and Adam and I. We really appreciate all the time you put in and listening to the podcast and engaging with us in our community, which is you can find our discord who are you B five at gmail.com. We have a Facebook and we have a Twitter that we mostly just wholly ignore. And to be perfectly honest, by the time this airs, the Twitter will probably be non-existent. So we'll see. All right. We'll see you next week. Internet. Bye. Bye.